coming up. So um, I guess I should start with an apology for scheduling this on primary election night, Roberto, but uh, we did it a long time ago and I don't think we were looking at the calendar very closely. Well, all I can say is we're ready to work anytime. Well, that's great and you guys aren't on the ballot tonight so we can all relax, but who knows, maybe before the course of the night's out somebody will come in with a breathless early voting tally and we'll find out if there's any headlines tonight or not. <laughs> But forget elections, forget politics. I want to talk concrete, cement, sidewalks. Oh, well, all right. And um, that's actually pretty sexy stuff. We're talking tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. This city needs so that people can walk safely uh, from home to school, from home to work, from home to store, through their neighborhoods. And it's actually something that Councilman Trevino and I have talked about uh, at great length because we are so far behind um, making up uh, for the sidewalk deficit in our city where you have two problems. One is the historic segregated development of the city meant that many neighborhoods in the urban core never got sidewalks, ever, or street lights or trees or any other amenities, drainage. And then you have sidewalk maintenance. Uh, if you live where I live, downtown in Southtown, the sidewalk, nobody walks on it, they walk on the street because of the poor quality. So while we're developing this new city and spending hundreds of millions of dollars in public funds to try to keep up with the sprawl, we have this problem in the urban core. And it's something you as an architect, not just as a, a councilman, identified early on as something, I, you're the first council person that I've ever known that actually made a big deal out of this. And the last time we talked, you were going to Las Vegas to, I think, the Concrete Association of America or something <laughs> convention, uh, and you were taking the head of transportation and capital improvements from the city staff with you to show him there's a better, less expensive way to build sidewalks that would help this city catch up. That is correct. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks, thanks for, uh, for all, uh, all you guys being out here tonight. Uh, we know it's a busy night and certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the things that I, th I think are very important, not just to District 1, but the entire city. And as Bob said, sidewalks are very important. And if you think about any visioning statement about a great city, doesn't it always include sidewalks? Walkability. And, and so, so, yes, I think it's, it's important to ask some, some really, really uh, big questions, some, some policy questions, some technical questions, and I, and I would divide it into those two categories. There are some technical uh, issues with how we build sidewalks. There's also some policy issues with how we build sidewalks. As you pointed out, there's a legacy of how the city was built, and the, the way the city was built was driven mostly by policy. There was some policy that did uh, purposely segregate certain segments of our society, it, it created uh, a separa separation. <clears throat> I want to point out that the city, as it's growing, uh, one, of the, one of the focuses, uh, fo the focus that we have today as a city is to try to uh, reinvest back into the, into the center city because we know that is a better use of our dollar. It, it, it really provides for a more vibrant city. And we want to avoid the sprawl that has occurred that started in the late 70s <clears throat> and, of course, is continuing up until today. Um, so let's, let's look at this a, a little bit about sidewalks. So one of the things I, I really look, looked at was how we build sidewalks. We have one method and one method only, and yet we have a city that is over 500 square miles. It, it, it sees different terrain, different soil types, different building conditions, and you only have one way of doing something that is so important. On top of that, I would point out that the, the magnitude that was, that was reported uh, about two years ago by, the, by Mike Frisbee uh, of TCI Transportation and Capital Improvements was $985 million to fix the sidewalk gap and all the sidewalks that need repair. And you think about one of the biggest projects that the city had was the convention center at $325 million. But we don't think of sidewalks as having the complexity of the convention center. So we don't apply that level of thought or com complex ideas or creative ideas that can maybe solve this. 
And I think that we can do it now. Uh, so I've broken it down into policy. So the first issue is we've got to look at our policy. Believe it or not, we talk about <clears throat> UDC in, uh, Amendment 2911. Uniform Development Code. Uniform Development Code. But basically, uh, if, if you've asked about sidewalks, you've probably heard somebody tell you, sidewalks are your problem. That is our, that's part of our code. In fact, it's actually also in the charter. In the charter, in chapter three, uh, paragraph 13, item 11, it says, the city can compel you to do sidewalks. <clears throat> A lot of people don't really understand why that's even in there. <clears throat> Both of those were written about the 50s. And I, I would say that the city has evolved since then. We've grown, we've got different growth patterns and we should find a different approach. And I think we need to really tackle this once and for all. Year after year, the number one ask from the city during the budget process is to, to build more sidewalks. It's the number one ask. But we don't create a plan. And so the first thing we need to do is create a master plan for sidewalks in the city. Then we can measure how far we're going. We can say, here's how we, we can actually build sidewalks throughout our city. Is it gonna take us 15 years? Is it gonna take 20 years? How many bond cycles can we utilize in that? How much money do we wanna appropriate from the general fund? All these kind of things need a plan. <clears throat> and that's why we wanna tackle first the policy part. Understanding that UDC 2011, I think it's, it's out of date to say, well, it's your responsibility, and yet every now and then we'll pick certain areas that we're, where we actually fix sidewalks. But we need, to, we need to face this head strong and say, look, we're gonna, we're gonna tackle this. We're gonna find a way to get this done because this is what the city's asking for. And we know great cities have great sidewalks. The second part of this is also understanding how we build sidewalks in our city. <clears throat> we created, we did an audit of sidewalks. And currently, for every dollar that you spend, only 30 cents actually goes to a sidewalk. And I don't think that is a good use of our dollar. No construction project could ever work that way. If we built the convention center in that same formula, then the, the convention center would cost a billion dollars. Where does the other 70 cents go? So it's called ancillary items. And I think it's important to talk about this because as I, as I mentioned before, we don't apply the, the, the sense that sidewalks is, are complex. We don't apply the level of thought that we do to more complex projects like the convention center. So we say it's okay for us to spend 30% of our money uh, only on sidewalks and the rest on things like repairing somebody's landscape, rebuilding irrigation systems. And I'm gonna get back to irrigation systems in just a second. Uh, curbs that are part of streets but not really part of sidewalks. Asphalt that needs to be repaired because we're doing curbs um, and, and any other items that, that really add all this great cost. $1.38 million went to landscaping in last year's budget. $18.8 .8 million was our entire budget for sidewalks. $5.6 million of actual sidewalk was built. And so I just want to point out that being creative and being thoughtful, I think, is a better approach. We can double the amount of sidewalks instantly by being more thoughtful with design, being creative. For example, we talk, I, what I just mentioned, irrigation systems. Anyone here, take a wild guess of where most of the irrigation systems exist <laughs> in the city. The gated communities. And yeah, certainly not on the west side, not on the south side. And we ran these numbers. In fact, I just met with Mike Frisbee and he, he said, I, I wanted to double check what you were saying. And he ran the numbers. District one, and I didn't think it'd be the lowest, but District 1 only had 3% of all the irrigation permits for the entire city. And so you think about the way we do the sidewalks and we talk about how these ancillary items affect the budget, then of course we're running out of money. And I'm, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, how do I solve the District 1 sidewalk issue? The real issue is I gotta solve the citywide sidewalk issue because the money is, 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 is really going out the door on a lot of these ancillary items. What I want, what I want us to do is to know that, that we need to be focused on the big picture and understand that if we really want to build sidewalks, we need to be thoughtful and have a better approach that is inclusive of the community, helps them understand what are some of our limitations. I'm not saying we, know, we don't have any ancillary items that we have to tackle. I'm simply saying that there's a, there's a better approach. 
Another example is landscaping. We, we tend to run a sidewalk and think that it needs to be straight, but if there's an obstacle, we can go around it, couldn't we? Um, I, I have seen handicap ramps put right at, uh, where there's a, a fire hydrant right in the middle. Doesn't make any sense, does it? We, if we shifted it over, it, it seems like that would have been easy enough when it was built. Um, building a sidewalk next to a curb uh, makes them feel like they have to build, rebuild the curb. If you build a sidewalk away from the curb, you don't have to be rebuilding that curb until you do that street. So when you do the street, that's when you should be doing the curb and gutter, not when you're doing the sidewalk. You're actually damaging the street because you're cutting into that area where the curb is, re-asphalting, you've created another seam in the street that may have had some life still left in it. I'm just saying we've got to be smarter and this is a great example of how design works. We've got to be more thoughtful about what you create. So this is, you're the first council person, as I said, that's ever cared about this issue. And you really started um, during the, the, the administration of Ivy Taylor when she was mayor. So we have a new mayor, Ron Nuremberg, a more progressive council, um, one more focused on urban core investment. How about the city manager, Cheryl Scully, and her staff? Have they become more responsive to this, or are you still tilting against windmills? You know, it's funny because I'm wearing my Don Quixote pin. Huh? Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's a great story, and it's certainly a great message uh, because you've got to fight. You've got you, you, you to tilt at windmills sometimes, and that's okay. Uh, the good news is that, no, we're working together. I had a great meeting with Cheryl Scully. Uh, just a couple of days ago to, to reaffirm that these numbers are not sustainable. They won't work. We have a better way. We could do a better job. And the same way we would approach any other capital project is the same way we should approach sidewalks. I can say that, that she agrees. We're, we're, now we're going to focus on how we can make that happen. We know that there's going to be a communications piece that comes along with that. We want to educate folks about what's happening. The last thing we want is for somebody to think we're raising taxes or we're doing something that is going to negative negatively impact them. Uh, we, are, we do want to, to build uh, great sidewalks. We want to take care of people's property. We want to be respectful. Uh, but I think that, that there is a better way, and I, and I, I, I feel like we've really shown a, a real path forward by understanding these numbers. I'll say, I'll say this, <clears throat> when I first looked at this issue, I was simply comparing the market rate price per square foot to what the, the price that the, the city pays per square foot, and that delta was so huge, it just made me scratch my head. <clears throat> Doing work for the city, obviously there's a little bit extra cost, there's more red tape, so you expect to pay a little more or something like that. But the original numbers that I was looking at with the $985 million, which $4 a square foot is a market rate price for concrete, and we were paying up to $28 a square foot. Now, that doesn't make much sense, does it? The, the problem is, is that we didn't break down the numbers enough. And after looking at the, uh, at the audit, the audit showed a very similar separation. The difference is uh, I showed a 26% variance, and the auditor showed a 27% variance. They were just, they're, they're pretty much on target. All I'm saying is we have, to, we have to keep our eyes on this because as big as it is, I think this could be a model for all our other infrastructure projects so that we can make a real impact citywide. That, that leads me to the 2017 $850 million bond. So I think most people in the room know that every five years we go to the voters and we ask them to approve a bond that allow the city to go out and sell X amount of dollars of bonds and we use that money that we borrow to undertake all the major infrastructure projects for the next five years. So the 2017 bond, 850 million, um, a tremendous 40% uh, increase I think over the 2012 bond. So a, a big number and yet um, when I talk to individuals that are involved in the private sector in a particular bond initiative uh, I heard from one person who said the $3.5 million bond project that they were involved in, the city told them you'll really actually get $1.7 million out of that. The rest of it, and again, this is City Hall accounting most of us aren't familiar with, 
goes into the management fees, which means the staff of the city, which <laughs> I understand is already paid for in the general fund, so why do we need to duplicate their payroll? But a significant percentage of each bond project is shifted over on the books to the city ledgers and going into that treasury. And I don't think people here know about it. I didn't know about it. And I'm not sure it's justifiable accounting. Well, Bob, that's a great, great question. And I'm glad you brought that up because it is precisely the thing that, that I keep running into. Um, another good example, another project that I started that's a good example of this is the San Antonio Under One Roof. <clears throat> uh, it's a roof repair program and it's an important program because it's, it's, it's a real effort to help people stay in their homes, age in place, protect existing housing. And the way I created the program was that I converted an old program called Let's Paint. Let's Paint had $200,000, and I don't care what kind of paint you're using, it's not gonna <laughs> save your, your roof or your house. So I, I wanted to do something that I, I felt was more impactful. I wanted to fix people's roofs. And it, it took a lot of effort to, to create it. It, it. I worked with staff. Uh, by the end uh, of, the, of the first year of the program, the $200,000, uh, I, I was charged over $60,000 in admin fees to get it off the ground. But you know, I said, okay, I gotta prove this thing and I wanna get this off the ground. So we were able to get 11 roofs out of that, uh, which is still good. <clears throat> and we worked with UTSA to get the science going. And the following year, <clears throat> we doubled the money. And uh, I went back to say, well, okay, this first year we had $60,000. What's gonna be the admin cost this year? Oh, well, that's easy. You're doubling the money, so it's $120,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, my head, went like that and uh, I said no way that is that is not it's not even math right I mean that's just ridiculous uh, it's it's not it's not something that anybody can can fully appreciate until you're going through it and I knew that every every dollar that I was fighting for to, to create a program was so important and so these admin fees were killing me that doesn't really pass the smell test, does it? No, no it, it doesn't. And I, but it goes to the issue uh, of, of, of how we build our city. You can't ask or request for innovation. You've got to demand it. And if you don't create the boundaries in which people have to work, then it's just going to go wherever it wants, right? And I think that's a lot of what's happening. We don't create enough boundaries. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, we have to find a way to be uh, innovative and creative to make something work. Uh, what we've done with the roof program, that is, by the way, proud to say, is now $2.25 million, and we're spending less than 120,000 in fees. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And part of it is because the, the department got creative about automating the application process, making sure that they don't have any wasteful trips out on the field, it's, it's being more efficient with, with the dollars, like anybody else would. Uh, so the same thing has to apply for sidewalks, for example. When I say we're spending 70 plus percent on ancillary items and we're only getting this much sidewalk, I want this much sidewalks and ancillary should be over here. So we create, if we create the boundary in which they have to perform, then you're gonna find people being more creative managing that process. Uh, so if we don't do that, then you're going to get high admin fees. And yes, I, I, one of the reasons I, I, I speak a lot about infrastructure projects and specifically sidewalks is because of the bond. And uh, it's, it's one of the biggest bonds the city's ever seen. But more importantly, District 1 has never seen this much money in the history of the city. 26% of the bond came to District 1. Mm -hmm. So I, wanna, I, want, I want to make that really go a long way. I want to multiply the effect. And, if, and if, if we're not watching how we're spending our money and we're not being creative and innovative, then it's, it's going to go part of the way, but it, it, it won't see its full potential. You know, the city recently took, I think, a, what many regard as a giant step. Council stopped 
incentivizing market rate housing development in the urban core because it seems like that pump's been primed over the last 10 years and affordable housing uh, is much more of an issue. When I hear um, inner city developers though, small, medium-sized developers talk about the Uniform Development Code, which is the rule book, if for lack of a better word, that's how the city develops or how people develop or don't develop in it. They, they're critical of the city and they say, the answer is always no to everything. Whenever you try to innovate, if you're not a major developer doing a 300 apartment multifamily, whatever you're trying to do, the bureaucracy just stops you in your tracks and kills your project. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's disheartening for young small businesses to encounter that at the same time that the public rhetoric is all about reinvestment in the urban core. It's, an, it's a contradiction. It is. And uh, I've been pushing for more performance-based codes than uh, descriptive codes. That's part of the, the reason why we, we get held back is that sometimes we're, we're, we're outlining too much and there, there's uh, little room for interpretation or even a, a misinterpretation of what's being done. I think we need to encourage more innovation. We need to encourage more uh, uh, exploration of how we can build differently. In fact, uh, I will tell you that I'm working with Rod Sanchez to find an area in District 1 where we can suspend most of our building codes and explore different building types, different building materials, uh, and, and really, really focus on how we can maybe take a better look at what is holding us back in our own code. He's uh, the head of city development services, and there's also an issue of whether the culture is how can I not help you uh, within the bureaucracy or whether the culture can be shifted to we want to help you, which is two very different points of view if you're a professional bureaucrat or civil servant. Yes, uh, well, I think, I think part of it is, is just certain limitations that we set. Um, I will say, having worked with development services even before I was on council in the private sector, uh, I've gotten to know a lot of those folks, and they do want to help. So I want to, I want to speak positively about development services. I, I think getting to know them, uh, taking the time to, to work with people, and understanding that they may not fully understand what is being done. In fact, I can still remember sitting down with a set of plans on a very big complex project that I was working on, and, and the guy, in fact, his name was Rudy Cantu, says to me, he says, okay, listen, I want to work with you, but I got to tell you, you understand this way better than I do, so help me understand. And we spent a lot of time, we invested time in, in getting a better understanding of what we were trying to do, what we were trying to build. And, and so my, my relationship with development services is, is more positive. But I do understand that there's limitations, and those limitations uh, are, are some of that bureaucracy, and I, I think we can peel back some of that. I think we, we, we can allow for the ability to, to provide uh, for more uh, exploration of, of how we build things and allow our professionals to, to, to be creative, to be innovative, and to try something without, without being restricted so much by, by something that's, that's written down and can be interpreted by someone who's doing a plan inspection or a code inspection on, on, on site. Most of my projects, before, uh, again, before I was on council, um, always went very well. The only time I ever got a red tag was when I did my own remodel, which I found kind of funny. Uh, but it's because I put a lot of effort and attention on the projects I was working on and very little on the one I was working on thinking, well, come on, I'm the architect, I, it's my house, big deal. But it, it's, I think there's a lot of uh, benefit in having a relationship with, with the very people you're working with uh, regarding code inspections, um, uh, plan review, and, uh, and of course, I do think that we need to explore what are some of the things that are holding uh, developers back or, or architects and engineers from producing what we know can be uh, affordable housing for, for San Antonio. So let's, let me change the subject completely before we go to uh, um, the audience and ask them to jump into the conversation and ask you about the politics of the firefighters union and their current um, challenge to city staff and to council, uh, their petition drive to strip quite a bit of the inherent home rule po po power from, from city council um, by um, 
forcing a referendum on city charter reform that would um, allow ordinances to be overturned much easier. It would cap the city manager, put term limits on that person as well as income limits, salary limits, and a number of other things. I mean, clearly we're in a something of a political war here. More than four years have gone by since the collective bargaining agreement expired. Uh, the two sides are in, they're at the level of the Texas Supreme Court in a lawsuit over the um, so-called evergreen clause in the contract. So there's a lot of animosity. Uh, it got very ugly with the police union for three years before a resolution was reached. We're four years into it with the firefighters union without so much as a single meeting. How do you, um, at the district level, but really is a, a part of a larger whole, the council view what, what, uh, what you face there? Um, well, I think, I think that this is really an existential issue that we're facing. Mostly because one of the most, most important issues uh, that we have in, in, in our city is, is our, our process to elect people like myself. We have that in place and the community depends on their elected officials to, to, to know what some of these issues are, to know, uh, to have a staff that is very capable to dig deeper, to uh, work with other council members and, and staff to um, address the, the, the community's concerns. Uh, what this does is it really eliminates that level of understanding and expertise that can, that can, uh, that it may be not provided to uh, the rest of the community. So it, it's a matter of, it becomes a, an issue where uh, any issue can become an issue that has to be voted on without having all the information. Uh, it becomes kind of a, a marketing campaign or a marketing contest, and I, 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 that's very troubling. Um, for example, we just had to vote on uh, rate increases, and we know it's a tough one. We, uh, our, our SAWS in increases, rate increases, was an incredibly tough vote. Uh, certainly, we don't want to have to vote on rate increases, but what I can tell you is that we, we really all got together, uh, worked with staff, worked with city staff, SAWS, uh, to try to find the best uh, possible course forward. That's very difficult to, to, to say would happen if we had what the firefighters want to happen, which is to simply raise that issue as a referendum vote and, and kick that out and, and hopefully just get a popular vote that could really uh, send the city into, into a death spiral. It's a lot of elections every time they disagree with the council. It's really issue. meant to confuse people, and, and, and that's, that's really unfortunate. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot in my office is how can we best inform the community about what we're working on and what we can do to translate or interpret some of the information so that it's relatable and digestible. Uh, something like that wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, putting that as a priority. It would just be a, a, uh, a push to, to uh, let's just throw a wrench in the mechanism. You know, I, there, we've received reports which we haven't been able to confirm that uh, the, uh, the private company the firefighters hired to come into San Antonio to seek it, um, to seek signatures have been going to senior care facilities to get people to sign up that they, that we know they showed up at several polls because we, we saw them there. They didn't seem to be getting a lot of signatures, but has anybody here been asked to sign the petition? Um, show of hands, anybody? Anybody sign the petition? You did? How come? I'm curious. So it's leverage for the negotiations? Oh, the firefighters union website uses the same term. I don't consider it a pejorative or an insult. It is. It is to you, but not to me.
you have to come to the table to negotiate, and the firefighters union hasn't come to the table in four years for even a conversation. That's, that's the point. The so-called evergreen. Well, that'll be litigated, and in the meantime, it Are would be not <coughs> right. It's 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 going through the system. That's the legal system, and both sides make full use of it. So we'll see it play out at the Supreme Court, which is the law and the state of the land. Um, let me ask anybody else, was it, were there some other hands who said they were asked to sign the petition? Did you understand what you were being asked and just decided not to sign, or you were busy, or you didn't know what? Interesting. So most people have had no contact with it either way. I want to go to something else which you just mentioned, which was how difficult it was to vote for the increases. Um, you probably saw the news today that the CEO of SAWS, Robert Puente, um, gave back his ninety-five or ninety-six thousand, ninety-eight thousand dollar bonus and told the board he wasn't going to accept it. And executive compensation has been an issue in the city for saws uh, for Cheryl Scully, who got a 75,000 bonus this year. Less attention being paid to, to, to the uh, CPS Energy uh, uh, CEO, um, Paula uh, Gold-Williams, but her bonus was 290,000. She's paid more like a private sector individual. Um, do you have a strong feeling about that and executive compensation and the public perception over bonuses to public officials, especially being a $46,000 a year councilman? Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I, I still bargain shop. Uh, no, I, I think it's a great point to make. The, the issue of compensation is, is something we should talk about. The real issue is these bonuses. Why do the bonuses keep coming up? Let's settle on, on an agreement compensation and just not have to be worrying about these bonuses. But we talk about uh, every year when somebody gets their bonus. The reality is you, you, you want to be competitive, you want to get the best talent, and, and that is how you get it. Um, but in the structure that we, we have as a city, these issues come up. And as you saw, uh, as you said, Robert Puente uh, pretty much returned his, his bonus because he felt that it was, it was uh, something that uh, was, had created a, a distraction from what SAWS was really uh, trying to do and as, as part of their mission to, to uh, grow the city and help fix a lot of the, the legacy issues that uh, the city has had for, for many, many years. We can't let that be the one thing that, that halts uh, the great momentum that, that we are seeing citywide. So as far as compensation goes, I think we want to be competitive and, and maybe we just take a look at how we structure bonuses altogether. All right. Um, how about some questions from the audience? You, sir? Do we have a microphone? I don't know. Uh, do, do you mind coming over to the microphone? <laughs> Would you? Apparently not. Yeah, I think your question so, is one about... Summarize it just a little bit in case people didn't hear in the back. Gotcha. So I think part of the question uh, regarding compensation and specifically the city manager's compensation is, 
is to explain how we arrived to, to that capacity or that amount and explain how it compares to other cities. Uh, what I can say is that we, we have done part of that. We're doing more this year. We've, what we've done is we've created a metrics uh, to, to really show uh, how some of the things that we set as part of the goals that the city is looking for are being met. Uh, what I can tell you is we have a very good city manager. We have a, a city that is well run. And there's a lot of complexity. Again, I just explained the complexity of sidewalks, and that's just sidewalks. You got to think about everything else that's happening. And I'll just point to one simple thing. Last year, we had tornadoes, and it affected my neighborhood just north of here. <clears throat> and I remember be that, that evening, uh, it hit about 10.30. And uh, 30 minutes later, I just I walked over three blocks away, and I could see the damage. And it was horrific. But all night long, you had city staff, <clears throat> the city, CPS, lots of folks out there working their butts off. It was well coordinated. It was well run. And I think you couldn't have asked for a better job. And if, if that's not a signal of a well run city, I don't know what is. It, it, it saved lives. It, it took care of things immediately, and I was glad to be a part of it. And so I, I can tell you, we, there's so many moving parts in the city. And uh, from our emergency operations center that took over that whole thing, to every single department head, uh, assistant city manager, deputy city manager, everybody was out there contributing and working very hard. It was a well-run machine. You know, people don't see the emergency operations center, and they're, they're not generally aware of it and it certainly includes our police and our firefighters. But um, I was out there when we thought Hurricane Harvey was coming here, which was quite a, mo a tense moment. I mean, people knew, it, they didn't, maybe they didn't know it was gonna be 51 inches of rain in 24 hours, but they knew it was a, 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 a catastrophic hurricane. And then suddenly it turned north and east and it went toward Houston. But we were very well prepared, as well prepared as you can be as a community waiting to get hit by something and we really seem to have learned a lot since 9-11 uh, with almost every opportunity to be prepared for something that's gotten better and people don't see it and they're not aware of it but it's there. Well we were very well prepared not only that we lent, it, we lent a hand over to Houston and Corpus and uh, we sent a lot of our resources to areas of need and uh, again a well-run city uh, we have really great people that they know what their job is, they know how to do it. I, I, I would say a lot of the things that I talk about are sort of that top layer, but for the most part, so many good things that happen in our city, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. Okay, do we have another question? And we do have two microphones on either side if, if uh, somebody would like to just walk over. Go ahead, sir. Well, you can get up and just go to the microphone. Is it working? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. But I can't, can't pull it. Don't no, break it. Okay, yeah. And this way. Okay, my, my question, can you hear me? Okay, my question is how do you see the pros and cons of uh, pathways, the connection between sidewalks and the uh, Riverwalk trails. Right now, the Riverwalk trails extend from Incarnate Word through downtown all the way to south to uh, Loop 410 South. And of course, if you make pathway connections between sidewalks and the Riverwalk trails, then people in the neighborhoods can use the trails for walking and biking or go to their destinations. And also people using the trails, even visitors from out of the country can use uh, the pathways to go to the sidewalks and do business on, with businesses along the, uh, the sidewalks. So how do you see the, uh, the pros and cons of, of, of new pathways uh, to merge you know, sidewalks with the uh, many trails in San Antonio? Talking about the Howard P. Greenway's trail system throughout the city that's still growing. Yes, I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful project. It's, it's wonderful because it's got a plan. And 
And the plan is to create a, a, a linked set of, of pathways that, that keep you safe, keep you on the, uh, on the greenway without having to cross the street. And uh, it, it's really quite amazing to, to see it uh, coming together. Sidewalks plays a, a, a critical role in that. We want to allow people to have access from their homes to those creekways and, of course, throughout the city. Uh, this is a, a, a great plan and uh, certainly appreciate all that's being done. And yeah, we want more pedestrian mobility. One of the things that I think comes along with sidewalks and pedestrian mobility is health benefits. We know we want people to be more active, more engaged, more part of, uh, to be a part of their community. That's what the, these things do, and it's a, it's a good investment. Uh, certainly, I'll continue to support. You know, we're at 15 years and counting into the community investment in both aquifer recharge zone protection and building out the trailway system. I think it's, is it an eighth of a cent or a quarter of a cent? An eighth of a cent. Okay, so uh, this current five-year <laughs> cycle will take us to 20 years, and uh, every time that comes up, there's, of course, other interests that would like to get that one-eighth of a cent sales tax for their project. I heard Mayor Nuremberg uh, talking to the Bar Association uh, last week about the possibility of converting that program to issuing bonds to finish out the, the, the recharge zone protection and the trailways building and transferring that money over to VIA. Most cities in Texas give one cent of sales tax to their mass transit system. We give a half a cent that's put us historically over the decades well behind and we're the one Texas city that gets no matching federal funds for building mass transit, which Houston and Dallas have, uh, if they haven't gotten a hundred million dollars, it's close to it each uh, over the last few years. So do you have a position on creative ways to fund more mass transit investment? Well, I think that um, part of that is to be smarter about how we spend on our infrastructure so that we can we can make more impact and complete the projects that we set out to, to, to tackle. Uh, that would make more funds available so that we can have a robust transportation system in San Antonio. So I certainly support uh, the mayor's effort on that. Uh, I think we also need to be thinking about how we plan our city and create better corridors, uh, which is what we're doing now. The SA Tomorrow plan and the corridors plan is really uh, helping to lay out a master plan for the entire city so that we can be more efficient about how we look at transportation for the entire city. Once again, we can't look at a lot of these issues as just district issues, they're, they're really citywide issues. The one thing about District 1 is it's, it's the core of the city and so we see ourselves as kind of the hub of, of a very important wheel. Well, a lot of times those projects don't take flight because they are for, they require a lifespan much greater than those of the office holders. We now have eight years that you can serve in office and it's probably your intention to serve all eight years, isn't it? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if elected, you'll, you'll stay the full four terms? Yes, uh, that's, that's my intention. Uh, there's a lot of work to do in District 1 and I, I, I feel like I, la I have a lot of left in me to, to get it done. Um, you're right. In fact, even the, the two-year terms, it, it makes it difficult to get anything done in two years. And, a lot of the great accomplishments that, that, that we started in the first term didn't really see a whole lot of success until the beginning of the second term. So it can be difficult that if somebody's only in there for, for two years, they may not be able to get something off the ground. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's a large city. There's a huge bureaucracy. And of course, we also have to remember that, that there's two rules that uh, we must constantly abide by at city councils. It should always be legal and ethical. That's right. So Mayor Nirenberg, when he was a councilman, he chaired that SA Tomorrow initiative. It was launched under Mayor Taylor. Um, and everybody is well aware that we're going to grow by a million people or whatever the real number is over the next 25 years. That plan seemed to be a great 900 page blueprint of how that growth is going to occur. But I, a lot of people had trouble getting their arms around what's it doing about that? What, what is it doing to reverse sprawl trends? and you just mentioned the corridors. So do you think we're moving toward enacting specific policies that are going to intelligently address sm smart growth? It depends. It depends how we collaborate with other government entities. Just as an example is uh, the Bear Appraisal District and property taxes and how property taxes affect the way the city grows. 
as well. So we need to be conscious about some of the things that the city does to affect property taxes too. Um, I did a map, I, I shared it with the Rivard report and, and it showed how property taxes ha uh, are really uh, different or show a, a different uh, percentage change depending on what part of the city you're in. The biggest change is the, the center city. And those changes impact the, the kind of investment that you, you can have in that part of the city. So I do think that we can have a plan uh, that, that lays out the, the kind of growth we'd like to see. But we got to partner. We got to partner with the paraprisal district, the county. We got to partner with the school districts. There's 15,000 parcels of untaxed property in the city of San Antonio because they're owned by the city, county, state, school district, church. or church. Those things really affect what we can do. <clears throat> and so we got to be smarter about our planning, and, and, and planning requires collaboration. Well, when you um, hear people have the neighborhood gentrification debate on both sides of it, on the one hand, we've done everything we can to incentivize people to go in where there's blight and where there's vacancy and bring back houses that have been long abandoned, commercial properties downtown that have been long abandoned. But you have this constant fear of people who are longtime, sometimes multi-generational residents of not being able to stay in their house because of market values going up. Do the respective taxing entities, including the city, are they of one mind to freeze taxes for people that are in those circumstances, either through income or age or both, so that we can, uh, we can honestly look at everybody and say you will not be forced out of your house because of rising values unless you so choose to sell it and cash in, but not because your tax burden will increase. So we're one of the few cities who actually provides an over 65 exemption uh, it, for, for all your taxes. So there's a freeze here in San Antonio when when you hit 65, what you pay freezes. Now, what happens is at 65, the value uh, is, is frozen. We subtract $60,000 60, from that value, and that's the tax you pay till the day you die. Uh, that we're one of the few cities, I think the only other city is Corpus, maybe. Um, so we do have that. That's just for the city tax, though? No, that's every, across the board. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and here's what's really important to point out that I've learned is that not everybody takes advantage of that, and that's really sad. It doesn't happen automatically? It does not happen automatically. And, and so we, uh, CCR that I filed was uh, talked about data sharing. So, for example, the, the Bear Appraisal District needs information about somebody who's over 65. Meanwhile, the city might have information about somebody who's over 65. SAWS has information. CPS has information. We're not sharing that. And if we share, the data that we do have to, to apply to programs that exist now, I think these are the kind of things that can help people right away. And so what I can tell you is there's, there's a, a large percentage of people who have not taken advantage of the over 65 exemption that can help them stay in their homes longer. We do everything we can. In fact, my office puts out a flyer uh, that explains the process to protest, explains these circuit breakers, explains where your taxes go, we hold a property tax summit every year with the chief appraiser uh, because this is really uh, an important issue for all of us. Um, you brought up an issue about income as well. So income-based, we're, we're gonna look at, at what we can do. Uh, uh, we had a meeting with, with Diego Bernal and, uh, and the chief appraiser to see what we can do to, 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 to help support some state legislation that can look at this type of circuit breaker, that can look at Maybe somebody who's lived in their home for at least 10 years, a certain income, can we, can we help in the same way we've helped with the over 65 exemption? The other issue is... Do you, do you have the authority now to do that or you would require state legislative action to give you that authority? It, it would have to be a state legislative That's action. That's a pretty tall order. It is, it is, but we're gonna, we're gonna try. Uh, the, the best thing we can do now is, is to educate people about the process that's avail available to them now uh, another key point is that uh, a lot of areas closer to the core are, are, <clears throat> are not owned or not homesteads. Uh, they're mostly rented properties. And so those rental properties don't have the same protections that a homestead does. So a homestead, as an example, has a protection of, of, 
of only a certain percentage of your, uh, of your property taxes going up. So we want to encourage more home ownership. But the reality is, is the closer you get to, to the core, the more uh, the, the, the residences are, are rental properties. And we, we want to have a good balance of both because we know that not everybody wants to be a homeowner, but, but we, we, we don't want it to be 80% rental and only 20% home ownership. That tends to, to shift the balance in favor of high property taxes because homestead tends to be more of a shock absorber for those neighborhoods. Well, Dr. Christine Drennan here at Trinity is pretty well known around the city now for her, her presentation on the history of the segregated development of the city and also the housing uh, crisis, the affordable housing crisis. And I think it's been said that there's as, as many as 140,000 affordable units of housing are needed for, to bring home ownership up to the, the level that we would want it. There was a time um, during the, uh, uh, the crisis uh, with the Great Recession and what was going on with banking when there were some very innovative programs, including city level programs uh, like in Austin where people were being given down payment uh, to get them out of rental units and into houses and it was encouraging more urban core density. Do you think we should be thinking outside the box like that and doing innovative programs that go beyond the traditional city hall uh, sort of governance? Yes, and we have tools available to us that, that, that allow for some flexibility. I'm going to go back to the roof program that I started. One of the reasons that I had to go uh, do it the way I did it was because CDBG funds and HUD uh, dollars can be very restrictive. Those are community development grants. Community, yeah, community development block grants, federal dollars. And they come with a lot of strings attached and can be restrictive by utilizing general fund dollars or city dollars, we have more flexibility to really tackle the issues as they're occurring in our city. Um, <clears throat> so I've identified other sources. Uh, we have the housing trust that, that, that makes money uh, helping to offset some of the, the development costs of some housing in, in San Antonio. Currently there's about $4 million in the housing trust. I utilize the million dollars out of that for the roof program we, we need to be utilizing as much as we can from that program. Uh, we only need about a million dollars of operating costs in there. We can, we can utilize the rest for some uh, great affordable programs. We also have money in our TERS, uh, which is a tax increment revitalization zone. And so we use the, the, the increment financing to help um, make sure that we're creating balance within that district and we can use funds there too. So we have a lot of flexibility uh, with, with different funding sources. Uh, we're gonna keep looking to see what else can, can allow that flexibility, but that's what we want as a city. Uh, as, we, as we're seeing different areas face different stresses or issues, uh, we, we wanna apply the tools that we do have here locally because they're more flexible than federal or state programs. Anybody need a new roof? <laughs> Go ahead, and I would love for somebody to come to the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, well, so, we have two. Go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. So you mentioned that um, the city is really trying to push um, home ownership among its citizens, um, but I think you've also explicitly stated um, here tonight and like previously, it's also in the essay tomorrow plan. I think. Um, that you really also want to like make sure like especially around like the city core that you densify um, So I'm wondering how the city plans on I guess balancing what seems to me like two competing interests You know making sure that people are living in maybe single-family homes, but also at the same time um, Making sure that we're not you know endlessly sprawling out maybe even beyond you know like our county line So if you could answer that that'd be great. Yeah, I think I think uh, what I was saying is that there needs to be a balance Anytime that there's one more than the other or a serious imbalance, that's when I think we have, we have some issues. So it's, it's not an either or proposition, it's, it's that we just need to have a balance. Uh, in areas where there's a, a lack of home ownership uh, in, in the magnitude of only 20% of that area, we, sim we, we could say that area could use some more home ownership. I'm not, simply, I'm not saying that we want 100% home ownership throughout our city, we know that's not sustainable or feasible for a lot of people. 
It's about balance. Well, there's something in between, too, because 10 years ago, developers would tell you, you can't build a townhome in San Antonio. There's no market for it. But in fact, we're starting to see that. So there's something between the single family home and the rental unit, and it's the townhome, which is built on shared property. There's less overhead. They tend to be smaller units. Uh, they appeal both to people that are downsizing, who might be more like my age, and appeal to young people who are buying their first home because they're more affordable. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be finally some of that in District 2, in District 1, um, that, that is starting to develop. And it seems like they're selling as fast as they're built, both market rate and some that are more affordable. Well, that's true. And I think what we're seeing is we're just we're, we're providing more options. And more options allow people to make better decisions. So. We just want to have a variety uh, of options for our city that allows it to grow in a, in a, in a healthy uh, way. And uh, that's a good example of how uh, we want to provide diverse products throughout the city. Uh, we don't want it to, to, to shift one way or another uh, too far to, to the left or to the right. We want to, to provide for, for growth within the city. Of course, that's why transportation is such a key component in how we connect our city, sidewalks, transportation systems, and of course, how we uh, develop the core. Ma'am, you have a question? And then we'll get to the gentleman behind you. Yeah, um, District 1 is proposing a large area rezone of about 1,400 acres in four neighborhoods. Um, and I was just wondering, a lot of those properties are being proposed are MF33 and RM4 down to single family. And has your office done an analysis or research on how this affects the future of our city with social inclusion, social equity, housing affordability, and uh, segregation going into the future when we know a million people are moving here? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And, and certainly one of the things, one of the reasons we are, we're going about this wide area rezoning is is because we're seeing a lot of zoning request changes in district one in fact we probably see more than anybody uh, what just, are you seeing what kind of specific requests from residential to residential to commercial we we just there's just a lot of activity there's and and with the growth i think you know we can say a lot of it is a good thing we can we we certainly appreciate the, the amount of growth and change that is occurring and requires some attention to, to zoning, and that's kind of the first step as people are developing things. But we're also seeing how some areas maybe don't make a whole lot of sense to the neighborhood, don't make a lot of sense to, to certain corridors of how um, a, 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 a city block might see an MF33 right in the middle. Another example is how you would have a property that has uh, sat there as a single family residence many years but it's zone MF 33 and they don't know that that zoning designation means that they're they pr they're paying higher property taxes because the land potential means a higher property valuation um, so what we what we've started is is just a process to talk about what was what are some of the things that we can do to improve the the zoning in District 1 and potentially other districts. What I can tell you is other districts have seen this and, and, and want to talk more about, uh, have a more robust discussion about uh, what this impact will mean. And of course, as, uh, to her point, uh, we're including the planning department, of course, and, and the community as a whole. Nobody's property, by the way, will be rezoned without their permission. We simply want to educate them about what the zoning means and, and how how it is, how it got there in the first place. A lot of these are actually zoning uh, translation errors uh, that got them to that point. And so we're trying to help com uh, communities uh, maintain their character, the nature of, of, of what they expect to see in, in, in future growth. Uh, and so this is part of that process. It's, it's a big effort, but we think it's, it's, it's the right way to do it, and we're doing it with the community. Okay, let's go to the gentleman over here first and then we'll come back. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, thank you all for having this. It's, I, I enjoy these kind of things, so thank you all. Um, uh, if you could educate me a little bit more on something that you had said. Um, Mayor Nuremberg's thinking of moving the one eight cent sales tax that's dedicated to water quality protection and moving it to transportation. What has to happen uh, legalist, you know, administratively 
Uh, does there have to be another initiative going to the voters to, to pass that to go to transportation since it was done with a water quality focus? And then I guess my second question is why don't we get federal monies? You had said that Houston and Dallas, San Antonio doesn't get federal monies for transportation. Why, why is that and why don't we? How, how can we get that? I'll let the councilman um, respond, but first I was just repeating what I heard the mayor say at a public venue. He wasn't committing to moving that. He was just saying, you know, we're trying to think outside of the box of innovative ways to finance, and that's one example that has come up. The reason we're not getting federal funds is because we have no multimodal um, rail projects, and both Dallas and Houston do, and there's substantial federal funds for cities that launch those, and until we launch one, we don't qualify for the money. We don't get that incentive. Right. Okay. Thank you. So I think part of, to, to answer part of your question, uh, though, um, not to speak for the mayor, uh, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about the success of, of uh, the Edwards Aquifer uh, Protection Program. I think part of the reason I, that- I worked there, so keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're doing a great job. Uh, and, and what we're saying is, is that we've shown that over time this has really worked and, and we know that, that there's, there's going to come a point where, where, where we feel like we have just about uh, gained enough momentum on that, that that we can maybe start looking at the, 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 the use of that 1A cent sales tax to help us with, with the issue of transportation. So I think that's what he's, he's talking about, and certainly I support that. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't support the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. I'm saying it's doing really well. We're gonna continue that. Uh, I, I think it's, it's gonna be a while before we can say we, 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 we flip that. There's still a lot of more work to be done with, with the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. And the voters would have the final say. And the, yes. And they probably wouldn't support it if there wasn't an alternative mechanism to keep the recharge protections going because they're very popular. That is correct. My name's Emil, and I was former planning director for the city from 1997 to 2007. So some of the things you're talking about here, I was involved in. I was lucky to uh, work with Bobby Pettis, who was a district one councilman a number of years back. And we actually did a plan for the north part of 410 going up uh, north of downtown. And we actually did the plan and we rezoned some of the properties because some of the issues that were there was you had a lot of different type of zoning like industrial zoning and apartment zoning in the middle of an, uh, residential areas. So we, we really made a, a, a difference in that. The other thing that we did was we also uh, created the IDZ, the infield development zone which is a, a zoning district that allows you to take a small piece of property in the inner city, and there's a lot of rules that are waived in terms of setbacks, what you do, and you don't have to meet a lot of conditions in terms of, of uh, landscaping and things of that nature. So there are some things that we, have, we did in the past that really has, has made some changes, and obviously there's more work to do. The other point I'd like to make, so people keep talking about not letting people go out to the suburb to build development, and that's never going to happen. We all know that. Once you go out of the city city limits, you're in the city's ETJ or you're in the county, and there's no <clears throat> rules in terms of what you can build or how you can build it. You come in with a giant master plan for an area, and that 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 entire area is developed. So I don't. I think the only way. We're going to address the issue in trying to minimize the number of people going to the suburban area is be competitive with the suburban area. So why do you go to the suburban area? A good education system, security, and you protect your investment in terms of what you buy. So I think if you could take those three elements and address them within the inner city, I think you could be doing something. Now, you may be have to pay more money for policemen, uh, for fire or other needs to address some of those issues and also work hand in hand with the school district to really make the school district so competitive that so somebody wants to move into the area. So those are just my general comments uh, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Not sure there was a question there. Yeah. But well, I mean, I think I would just answer that with, again, it's about a, a balanced approach, and certainly we're not going to stop uh, suburbia, suburbia but uh, you know, we, we, we certainly want to offer options for people to, to choose if, if they want to, to come to the center city. Well, and I think the most interesting cities in the world are the ones we go visit because their urban cores are so interesting. I don't think I've ever gone anywhere to see the suburbs of a city. And um, the cities that we do go see are the ones that are dense, they're socioeconomically diverse, they're ethnically and racially diverse, and, um, and often they're historic. They've been there a long time and have developed organically over a long time, and those are the places that we like to go to, big or small. Yeah. I, there's a great book called The Geography of Genius. I, yep. I recommend everybody to That's read that book. book. Uh, you think about how you know, the, these cores uh, create some of the, the, the most amazing things uh, that we, we know have occurred throughout history. The, the fact that Florence, Italy, for example, one of my favorite cities, mm. had a core, and in that core you had over 80 of the world's greatest architects, I mean artists and architects, painters, sculptors, existing in a certain period of time and it was the city that was sort of embracing that and 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 helping to 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 nurture that and so that i think that's that's an important point you've been very patient no problem uh so um i'm a small time local developer um, and that focuses on um, the urban core and much of it it's in it's in your district so i guess i'm going to made some notes, but um, I guess really the, the, the bottom or the, 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 the center of the question is, is just to help me understand um, or maybe hints on how affordable housing is going to work on uh, just from my side, just what, what, what costs I, I've been going through, I guess, is, um, you know, there's SAWS impact fee waivers that, that we can apply for, and that happens once a year, which Thankfully, I, I took advantage of that. There's iCRIP, which helps a little bit, and I know there's a lot of uh, CPS impact fees. The land isn't getting any cheaper, so that's one thing that, that, that that's to, to look at. Another thing is materials aren't getting any cheaper. Uh, construction isn't um, permitting, and I'm glad when I walked in, I heard you talking about streamlining <laughs> permitting. I have to say that that is takes a, a long time sometimes, and I'm you know you work with you know zoning. I'm, I work with zoning. Hey, let, we, let's take one property and maybe put there was once one house here on a large lot. Maybe we put three smaller homes on there. So I'm dealing with zoning, and then the next step maybe I deal with HDRC, and then the next step maybe the homeowner uh, the neighborhood, and then the OHP, and then it's kind of it, it takes a, a little while, so um, I was real happy to see, and maybe even I work with the Board of Adjustment, and then I have to get to CPS and SAWS, so it seems that there's a lot of moving parts, and that it, it takes time to, to actually start. So I guess going back, um, how is it going to get more affordable? How does, how's, maybe just hints on. That, that young man is the snapshot right there of what I hear over and over from young, small business people trying to make a difference. They're not some big out-of-town corporation coming in here with funding, and it seems to me that we won't do affordable housing, if I can amplify his question to you, without the city putting real money into it so that literally every one of his fees would be waived, which would help his pro forma. But second of all, some way it has to be found to push him through that bureaucratic pipeline with some speed so that his project can take flight instead of spending eight or eight months or a year trying to get something off the ground and are we up to that in the city to create those kind of conditions for people like him you better believe it i, I think this is uh, number one i want to just you know commend you for being here tonight I, uh, i'd like to talk to you some more uh, this is something that, that i want to tackle with you we were just talking about it and what i can say is that a, a, a lot of what occurs is is understanding the different processes that, that the city has and making sure that people understand what they're having to go through and, and how we can help with that. Of course, there's different overlays that the city creates and those overlays uh, push you to uh, OHP or HDRC. Uh, what I can say to you is I encourage you to, to, to work with my office 
so that we can get a better understanding of, of what some of your goals are, and then we can maybe try to create a, a, a better pathway forward. As far as affordable housing, I, I think we, we really need to start asking some seriously tough questions. And that's uh, affordable housing needs to, needs to really have a serious look on, uh, look of, uh, in terms of innovative construction, scale, type of materials, land values, uh, and how does the city participate in that? Our codes, do they encourage that? Probably not. Uh, again, that's why I want to have codes that are more performance-based so that we can allow for some, some incredible design innovation that we may not have thought about, ways to use materials in, in a new way, uh, utilizing new materials altogether that may not be in the code. Uh, this is what's going to help get us there. I think these are the pressures that help to spawn innovation. And, and, and I, I, just, I just encourage you to keep, keep pushing and let's work together. I, I'd like to, to find ways to, to make it work for people like you and, and others that are, that are trying to make this happen. I think this is the right approach. We want to get people who are motivated to want to build things like this in the district and the city as a whole. Maybe we give a young developer like that one of those 15,000 parcels the city owns and others for free and let him build something that puts it on the tax rolls. You're not kidding. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, this is, look, so in, in all seriousness, uh, the city is doing a lot uh, to consolidate. But for example, we, we, we're taking a lot of our city departments and services and we're moving to the Frost Bank Tower. We're getting rid of our buildings. We're monetizing those buildings. Uh, not only did, we, did the city make money on those buildings, but they're back on the tax rolls. Well, and it's also spurring incredible infill development which is great. So I, I think we do need to talk about this. We need to, we need to understand how all these agencies play a, a pivotal role in how the city grows, how it's developed, and how it's maintained. Mr. Mall, how has uh, equity budgeting changed your priorities for District 1? Equity budgeting, uh, you know, this is, this is really uh, something that we tackled in this year's budget, and it, it, what it meant was uh, understanding what some of the needs uh, that, ha that have impacted different di uh, districts differently uh, so that we can apply money that is needed to, to help bring back some balance. We have a way to grade streets, for example. And of course, we're in an institution, educational institution, and so everybody knows that a passing grade is about 70. So we use the same grading system for roads. And what we notice is that the, the roads in the northern districts are, are, have a higher score, and the, the, the roads district one and below have very low scores. So we're, what we're simply saying is we need to apply more money in the infrastructure projects to help bring back some balance so that, so that we can say the infrastructure improvements in district one, district five, three, are, are equitable with the other areas that have a much, much higher score than these areas. Uh, but I go back to the very first thing we talked about. Um, <clears throat> we really need to start talking about how we, how we apply that money so that- How we spend it. So, we, so that we're making a greater impact. The, the spending of our dollar needs to go further. Uh, because of equity budgeting, we can see that there is a serious imbalance throughout our city. Uh, I, I was given a map of, of, of all the irrigation permits pulled throughout the city, and it, it's, it's amazing how it's all on the north side and almost nothing uh, towards the south. Uh, but that just, I think those are indicators of the, the kind of uh, capacity or wealth that might be in certain parts of our city and in other areas that don't have those opportunities. You can even take a heat map, and I mean the temperature map, right? And, and look at what are some of the hottest parts of our city. Some, some of the hottest parts of our city don't have trees. It's a, it's, it's a simple thing that you know, most people who live in, in, in great neighborhoods just simply want trees, and they want sidewalks, and they want a walkable community, and they want great streets. These are things we can all do. That's an equity budget. 
Okay, we're, on, we're running out of time, so a couple quick questions before we wrap it okay. up. Okay, real quick. Um, I met an interesting couple from England a couple weeks ago, and they were here. They're retired. They come for three months at a time. They were staying at a and b and they had heard about all the stuff. I want to know what your position is on the, the b and b issue and, you know, where we stand. I know you're working on our new ordinance and everything, I think, right? Yes, and we're, we're identifying the different types. So uh, the, the B&Bs, uh, we have a type one and type two. We know that the type one are those that are, that, that are you have a homeowner uh, that, is, that is there and simply renting out a room. The type twos are those that are more investment properties being, uh, utilizing the B&B system. Uh, through the task force, we're working a lot to, to identify uh, a, an equitable solution that allows for, for both types to, to exist in the city. Um, we know that it's, this is something that is kind of scary for a lot of our historic districts. Uh, we we want to protect our historic districts. Uh, the character uh, needs to be maintained. And, and, and so some of the, the, the concerns that people have with regards to these, the B&Bs, at least the type twos, is that the, the, the areas are so attractive that they become uh, more of a transient neighborhood. So, we're addressing those concerns. I think we can find a balance, and certainly we, we want to make sure that we're always keeping in mind that uh, the, the, the history and nature of our city is the reason why those folks from, from England visit us for three months at a time. I mean, they, they come to see uh, the architecture, the culture, the history that's here, the food. Uh, we got to protect all that. And it seems like there's going to be some limit put on the type two in specific neighborhoods yes, to there, there's make sure be, yeah. that that balance is not lost. Can I ask one other quick question? I don't know, his answer may not be quick. Where do we stand on the great Alamo reimagining and redesign? Uh, oh, we'll now dedicate the next two hours to that <laughs> quick question. Okay, um, uh, well, I, I'll give ahead. a quick update, I think, because it is exciting. And, and I just want to say uh, one, of the, one of the great, great privileges that I've had as a council member and of course, as an architect, is to be part of this uh, endeavor. The Alamo project is one of the biggest projects the city's ever seen in terms of scale and capacity. Uh, it's, it's also something that is important to the entire state of Texas, if not the world, in, in making sure that we mark history. Um, so what I can tell you is we, we have been working with, with an, uh, the interpretive design team to take what the master plan team had recommended that was driven by the guiding principles that were developed by a 21 member citizen advisory committee. Uh, all that is in place, all that is moving forward. Uh, I'm happy to report that over the next few months, we'll be presenting uh, some, some of the uh, ideas moving forward, getting community input, involving the 21 member advisory committee. Uh, they themselves, the, this design team and other members, uh, including myself, uh, will join uh, a statewide tour of what's being, what's being talked about here in San Antonio and how it impacts not just San Antonio but the entire state of Texas. So lots of things that we're going to be showing. Uh, as, as you mentioned, we, we need a couple hours to really talk about all the great elements that, that are going to be happen, happening for the Alamo. Uh, but stay tuned. Very exciting stuff. Well, I have very strong feelings about a plan that included glass walls and cutting down all the trees in the plaza, and I think an awful lot of people will be watching the leadership of your generation and judging you guys in no small part by how you do redevelop the Alamo Plaza. It's the, arguably the signature project of our time, even more so than Hemisphere. I agree, and, and what I can tell you, Bob, is, is that uh, the, the, the work that's being done on the Alamo is very considerate of, of things like trees, uh, the, the, the heat that is generated in our city, uh, the interpretation uh, of elements like glass walls, which by the way is, is not a part of the master plan adoption. Right. So uh, I encourage people to, to, to know that this is part of the process. And what, 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 I, what I think is gonna occur is really uh, you know, the next step in evolving the, the work uh, so that it, so that it's uh, something that the, the community feels like they've been a part of as well. We've, we've listened to a lot of the issues. 
we know it's an important community space. Uh, and so I'm, with that, I can tell you I'm very excited with all the work that we've put into this, this project. I think this is going to be something the city can be very proud of as well as the state of Texas. Okay, the last two questions come from the executive director of City Year, our wonderful program, and then Zabdi Salazar, the editor of the Trinity Contemporary. Go ahead, Kelly. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the gentleman earlier was just talking about investing in our school districts in our urban core to make that a place that's attractive for folks to live, work, and play. Um, so at City Year, we are recruiting, training, and deploying young people between the ages of 18 and 25 into our urban core public schools each year to support students who are off track and getting them back on track. And we're reaching 6,000 students each year. Um, in seven SAISD schools with 89 core members. I think one of the cool things about our program is we're also attracting young people to our city. So of those 89 young folks last year, 15% were from San Antonio, and after they did a year of service with City Year, 43% stayed here and went on to become part of our workforce. Can you talk a little bit about what the city's position is on deep investments in education programs that really work versus kind of the wide investments? Um, and I, I ask because specifically, I'm selfish, but we are trying to grow um, to reach 50% um, of the off-track students in San Antonio. And we, we can't do it without the support of the city. Hard, hard not to be on their side. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is going to sound almost like it was a, a plant, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know we, we are working on uh, some 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 big picture initiatives. But I can talk to you about one very specific issue that has just recently uh, bubbled up. We, we've been tackling this now for almost three years, but uh, we know in District One that a partnership with SAISD is is critical. We know they have a lot of challenges. We know that they, they, they are lacking resources and funding to maintain their existing infrastructure. Uh, so we need to be helpful. We need to be thoughtful about how we maintain, help to maintain some of that infrastructure. That's why we, we partner with them on identifying or prioritizing things like path, safe pathways to school, working with SAPD to provide public safety at schools. And, and crosswalks, uh, but I want to talk to you about one thing that I think I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, and that's this uh, Beacon Hill Elementary School. There's a historic structure on there. It's, it's over 103 years old, and, and um, it's a beautiful structure. It's next to the new Beacon Hill uh, Elementary that is now an academy. And the community has, had, when I first got on the council, they asked me, to demolish that building. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Um, it's, first of all, it's not our building. And, uh, and, I, and I, I just wanted to take a closer look before we simply go and, and try to push for the demolition of any building, for that matter. Um, what I can tell you, I'm just fast forward three years, um, the gifted and talented kids at Pekin Elementary, third graders, uh, created a, 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 a a presentation that would just blow your mind uh, because they they want action they want something going on at their academy and they know that the the academy may grow here in the next few years they know that this building is just at a standstill so what I can say is some of the things we can do as a city is help the school district understand what are some of the the challenges that they have they just passed a 400 million uh, dollar bond to help address an aging infrastructure. They have a lot of historic schools for that matter. And a lot of these schools are not ADA compliant. They're not, they, they have serious uh, uh, limitations. And those limitations, those tangible limitations create educational limitations. So we wanna be respectful and mindful of that. And uh, what I can say is, it, is, is it, in my role, I wanna help to provide as much support and, and, uh, and uh, collaboration in terms of how they're building out that infrastructure. This is, this is important for all of us. When we talk about how we, we grow our, our city and, and the inner city's uh, health, the uh, school district has to be right there along with us. Uh, we certainly appreciate their investment at Cast Tech and, and, and other academies. Mark Twain uh, 
Dual Language Academy is doing an amazing job. So we just need to, to, to find ways to collaborate and, and, and see how we can uh, uh, make better use of our funds. You would probably favor more money for a people budget for city year, just I guessing. <laughs> Okay, Zabi, you get the last question of the yes, night. Yes, um, so my question is that here in San Antonio, it's known a lot that we're for a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors, and even Trinity here has a really great entrepreneurship program. And I'm wondering, as a representative or councilman, um, uh, there's a lot of the question of like how much there's so much, so many people and so many organizations who want to support entrepreneurs, yet at the same time we have so much um, in income inequality, especially around different zip codes. Like, how does the uh, council address such like great disparity in terms of like trying to progress in Antonio, but then not also forgetting about the inequality in different um, areas of, of, of the city? So I was wondering, how, how has the council really uh, thought about addressing that issue? And like, how does it also collaborate with the entrepreneurship sector at the moment? Um, great question. I, I guess part of it is, is, is uh, understanding how we, we must tap into the, the uh, enthusiasm and, and, and youth that, that is existing here in San Antonio. We just heard from a young developer uh, who was is, who is trying to make it here in San Antonio. Uh, we are investing in things like geekdom, uh, the tech sector, knowing that there are certain uh, parts of our, our community that, that attract uh, uh, younger people and, and, and new industry into our city that, that can help keep part of our city vibrant. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, I think it's, it's, it's understanding that, that we as a city have to do more to communicate all the things that we do as a city, all the things that impact everyone's lives day to day. And I, again, I, I, there's been several questions of, of, of our process, of, of how things work in the city. And you know, I can tell you that what, what the, the advantage I have is that I have a staff, I have access to city staff, I have access to uh, 58 city attorneys, uh, the community doesn't necessarily have all that. And um, we need to be, do a better job to, to inform the community about some of the things that we're doing to, to help create some of those process. But I would also ask you to, to contact your council member, that being me, uh, about some of the opportunities that you might uh, like to explore. We'd love to try these things for, with you. Um, the secret of my success on certain projects has been that I just simply try them. I pilot programs. The, the roof program was a pilot. We called it that. It was a pilot roof program. It wasn't until the third year that we spent $2.25 million, $2 million that we took the pilot name off. Um, you know, let's try stuff. Let's, let's see what some of the concerns you have. Uh, help, help us build some policy that can address your specific concerns. And, and I, I think that that is the ultimate role of, of city government because uh, you know, we can talk to you directly and see what we can do to, to, to create a pathway forward or, or an opportunity to collaborate. Well, time is up and um, we at the Rivard Report believe civic engagement and good journalism go hand in hand. So we really appreciate all of you being out here and showing up. Uh, we hope you'll read us and we also hope you'll support us. We're a, a humble, all local nonprofit and member supported. And if you like these kinds of events and want to see more of them, we hope you'll become a, a member and a donor. And I hope you'll all join me in thanking Councilman Trevino for spending the evening with us here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>